Although it's hard to predict the future, and no one can guarantee an individual person with multiple sclerosis will have a mild course of illness, based on observational studies, the following factors are associated with an on average lower risk of disability. Citations below. Number one, the initial symptoms. For people whose early symptoms of MS are visual symptoms, as in with optic neuritis, or sensory symptoms, as in numbness or tingling, this has been associated with a lower long term risk of disability compared to other early symptoms such as weakness of the body, clumsiness or imbalance, or bladder dysfunction. For instance, in this study, people who had their first attack as optic neuritis had less brain lesions on average and a lower risk of subsequent relapses. Number two, good recovery from attacks. So if someone has an attack but recovers completely or nearly completely, that's linked to a better prognosis. For instance, if someone has optic neuritis but vision returns turns to normal or transverse myelitis and the numbness and weakness goes away over time as opposed to having residual symptoms that persist permanently. For example, in this study, the number of incomplete recoveries from relapses, 0, 1, 2, or 3 or more, was strongly linked to disability. Disability is measured here on the y-axis with the EDSS scale, which is Expanded Disability Status Scale, a measure of disability in MS research. and our refer to it throughout this presentation. Number three, fewer attacks early in the disease. So let's say someone has an attack like optic neuritis and then no subsequent relapses for five or ten years, that's highly favorable as opposed to someone who has several attacks within the first few years of disease onset. Another way to say this would be a long gap between the first and second attack. For instance, in this study, people who had only one relapse in the first few years of diagnosis, their median time to develop secondary progressive MS, or a slow worsening of disability after an initial diagnosis of relapsing MS, was 20 years. But for people who had three or more attacks early in the disease, it was only 15 years, a five-year difference. Interestingly, relapses seem to have a lower correlation with long-term disability later in the disease, especially in people who already have progressive MS. It seems that the timing and severity of the slow insidious progression is more prognostic than individual relapses in people with progressive MS. Number four, having less disability early in the disease. Doing well for the first two, five, and ten years is meaningful and does correlate with long-term outcomes. For instance, this study looked at people with so-called benign multiple sclerosis, which they defined as having an EDSS of less than three. That's a low score on the disability scale I mentioned earlier. And when you look back, they had less baseline disability 30 years ago compared to people who did not have benign multiple sclerosis. This other study looked at randomized controlled trials testing medications to treat MS, and it found that people who had less disability at baseline seemed to benefit from the medications more. They had less disability progression while on treatment. So having less disability early on is good twofold. It correlates with better prognosis and may even make the medications more effective. Number five the type of MS. Specifically, having relapsing multiple sclerosis is more favorable than having progressive MS. This study from the University of California, San Francisco, called the MS Epic Study, looked at people with relapsing onset MS. And even 20 years later, only 16.2% had an EDSS of 6 or greater. At an EDSS of 6, a cane is needed to walk 100 meters, which is quite favorable. However, the same study looked at people with progressive multiple sclerosis and the prognosis was worse. Most had progressed over time. Number six, having less brain lesions on MRI. Now there's no way I could look at an MRI scan and say exactly what symptoms someone has, but on the average there's a correlation. For instance, this study found that people who had fewer brain lesions were more likely to have benign or milder multiple sclerosis. Now keep in mind there can be a so-called clinical radiologic dissociation where someone has a lot of white matter lesions but is doing well, presumably because they have significant 
significant remyelination and not too much axonal damage, but there is a correlation there. Also, it's known that certain features on MRI are more associated with disability, like having a lot of brain atrophy or shrinkage or spinal cord atrophy or a lot of lesions high up in the cervical spine or at the junction between the cervical spine and the medulla. So if you don't have those features, it's a good sign. Number seven, younger age. This study looked at the probability of progression over a six year period. And one of the strongest predictors was just age. It's good to be young. Even though younger people have more MS relapses, they tend to make better recoveries and they're much less likely to have progressive MS. Number eight, being female. Although the majority of people with MS are women, about 75%, they do seem to have slightly less disability on average. For instance, this study shows the survival curve of people who have benign MS defined as an EDSS of less than three, and at all time points, it's a little bit more likely for women. This tends to be greatly overstated. In reality, the difference is quite small. It's actually not known for certain if this is a true biological phenomenon or due to some other other confounder, like men being less likely to be diagnosed if they have very mild MS or being diagnosed later or something else like that. Number nine, low levels of serum neurofilament light chain. Neurofilament light chain is a breakdown product of the central nervous system and can be found in the blood and higher levels are associated with worse prognosis of MS and with MS relapses. The correlation is not very strong in an individual person. There's a lot of variation, so it's not too too predictive, but on the group level, having lower levels is a good sign. Interestingly, it's more predictive in people who are not taking the highly effective or stronger multiple sclerosis meds, and it's less of a predictor in people on those better drugs. Speaking of which, number 10, taking highly effective disease-modifying therapy, in other words, the stronger, more aggressive medications. Now these treatments do have risks. Many are immunosuppressants. They can cause infections and other side effects. You have to weigh the risks and benefits, but they have been correlated with better outcomes. For instance, this study in Norway looked at the probability of no evidence of disease activity, NIDA. In other words, no relapses, no new MRI lesions, and no progression of disability over a one-year period. And it was 68% in people taking these stronger drugs versus only 36% in people taking less effective treatments. And this study from the Finnish MS registry found similar results. This is not a randomized trial, but they did use propensity matching to try to correct for some potential confounders. Obviously, what medication someone takes is not completely completely random, but they found the highly effective disease-modifying therapies. In this study, they looked at Tysabri, Lemtrada, Ocrevus, and Rituximab was associated with a lower rate of confirmed disability progression, only 28.4% versus 47% with the less effective drugs. And I want to state very clearly that it's actually impossible to predict the future of someone with MS. There's so much variation. I've had patients who have many of these factors who have had problems problems down the road and people with none of these factors who have done surprisingly well. So even someone with a lot of experience seeing people with multiple sclerosis, I just don't know what's going to happen to an individual person. There's a lot of variation, but these things do correlate on average with future disability and it could be useful information. I'd be interested if you could share your own history of MS a little bit in the comments and if you had many of these factors or didn't early on in the course of illness. And let me know if you have questions or suggestions for future videos.